Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, double CCA and Cisco Press author, and I've got a question for you. Have you ever wanted to go after one of Cisco's new collaboration certifications? Well, in this video, I'm going to train you on the six core systems that you've got to know if you're going to be going after the CCNA or the CCMP in collaboration. And if you're working towards a collaboration certification right now, you know that one of the challenges is that these certs are so new, there's not a lot of self-study material out there, and it can be really hard to get hands-on experience. Well, I faced the same issues. In fact, I failed my first attempt at the CCA Voice Lab that was the predecessor to CCA collaboration and one reason was I didn't have any solid training well fortunately I did pass on my second attempt after buying some great training now let's jump into these six core systems that you've got to know about a couple of these core systems fall under the call agents category it's a call agent to which our IP phones register the call agents have call routing knowledge. They know how to get from phone A to phone B. They know how to direct a call out to a gateway to get out to the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. And we've got a couple of call agents that we want to talk about. One is server-based. It runs on a server. One is router-based. It's a configuration inside of a router. But when I think about call agents, I'm reminded of that classic movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Do you remember the scene where Dave Bowman is trying to deactivate the HAL 9000? And a very concerned HAL says, just what do you think you're doing, Dave? Well, if our PBXs, our private branch exchanges, could talk, I think they would say something very similar if they saw us unboxing a call agent in their presence. The first call agent we want to talk about is a Cisco Unified Communications Manager, and it can run on a server, much like the server, a rack manable server that you see here. Let's now take a look at a topology to see exactly how this CUCM, the Cisco Unified Communications Manager, fits into a network, how phones register with it, how phones call one another, and how we can call out to the PSTN. Here we've got a couple of Cisco IP phones. The phone in the bottom left, that's a Cisco 9971. Notice it has a camera built in. We can see video on the screen. The other phone is a Cisco 7965 phone. It's got a color display, but it doesn't have video capabilities built into it. We're connected into a switch, which connects into our communications manager, which connects into a gateway. A gateway is oftentimes a Cisco router that gets us out to the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, out to the rest of the world. Let's take a look at a few characteristics of CUCM. The first one is it is server-based. It runs on a server. It does not run on a router, which is different than our other call agent we'll talk about in just a moment. And the protocol that's spoken between that server and the IP phones could be SIP or it could be skinny. SIP, SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, it's an industry standard protocol. And Cisco seems to be migrating towards that protocol for most of its newer phones. Or it could be Skinny, the Skinny Client Control Protocol, or SCCP for short. That's a Cisco proprietary protocol. And when extension 2001 on screen wants to call extension 2002, using a SIP or a Skinny message sent up to the communications manager, it says, hey, I want to call 2002. Well, the communications manager server knows exactly where that phone lives because that phone registered with that communications manager server. So it sends down a Skinny message or a SIP message to 2002 saying, hey, somebody wants to talk to you. And it responds and the communications manager tells the two phones to start talking to one another and the actual voice voice media, the speech is carried via a different protocol called RTP, the Real-Time Transport Protocol. That's a Layer 4 protocol that's encapsulated inside of another Layer 4 protocol, UDP. And notice that the communications manager is not in that call flow. RTP packets do not go to the communications manager. The communications manager gets the call set up. It can set up, it can maintain, it can tear down a call, but it doesn't need to see all the voice packets going between our phones. Another feature I want you to know about when it comes to the communications manager server is that we can have clustered servers. Instead of just having one server and therefore a single point of failure and limited scalability, we can have a grouping of servers that share the same database. They know about the same phones and the same gateways and the same route plans. And by having multiple servers, we have more capacity. And we also have some redundancy. If a server goes down, another server can simply take over. And something else that we could do on the communications manager is define users. We could go in and say, here's the username and the password for the user that's going to be using extension 2001. Here's the username and password for the user that's going to be using extension 2002. But in many environments, we've already got a massive username and password database. It's an LDAP database, a lightweight directory access protocol database. 
I've asked students for years what they're using as their LDAP server, and well over 95% tell me that they're using Microsoft Active Directory. Yeah, if you've already got Active Directory in your network, and it already knows about all your users, and it already has passwords for your users, why try to duplicate that on the Communications Manager? You can have the Communications Manager go out and integrate with that LDAP server, and the users known to the LDAP server can be the users known to our Unified Communications Manager server. And we can, of course, speak off of our local network. We can communicate with another cluster of servers for even more scalability. We can communicate with a gateway. Let's say we want to call out to the PSTN, the Public Switch Telephone Network. Well, we can do that by going out to a gateway via the MGCP protocol, the H.323, or the SIP protocol, like you see here on screen. And then that gateway might go out of some sort of a time division multiplexing circuit, like an ISD and PRI circuit, as an example. And just a bit more about this idea of clustering. Here I've got a cluster of five servers. Notice that there is one server that's designated as the publisher server. That has a read-write copy of the database. The other servers are subscriber servers. They're going to receive a read-only copy of that database. So when I go in and say I want to add a new phone, or I'm going to add a line to this phone, and I make that database update, that gets written to the publisher, and then that change gets pushed out to the different subscribers in that cluster. That's the way database replication works. However, there's other communication going on within this cluster. There is intra-cluster communication, as indicated by the red dots on screen. This is real-time information. For example, my phone goes off hook. This particular directory number is now in use. Well, other servers in the cluster need to know about that. And that kind of real-time information is communicated through this inter-cluster communication protocol. Now, that's our first call agent, Cisco Unified Communications Manager. It's server-based. Let's take a look at our next call agent. Our next call agent is router-based. It's Cisco Unified Communications Manager Express. We go into a router with an appropriate feature license, and we configure it as a call agent. It's called CUCME for short. Let's take a look at how CUCME fits into a topology, much like we did with CUCM. Just like we had phones registering with a Communications Manager server, phones can register with this Communications Manager Express router. It's got a similar set of features compared to the Communications Manager server. It can do call processing like the Communications Manager server did. We're still going to be using SIP and or Skinny for our IP phones to register and communicate with this call agent. And if I want to set up a call between these two phones, it's going to work very similarly to how it did with our Cisco Unified Communications Manager server. The call is going to be set up, and then we're going to have RTP, the real-time transport protocol, going directly between the two phones. The CUCME does not get involved in that call path. RTP goes directly between our end devices. And we could also speak out to the PSTN. If we want to call out to the PSTN, we could have the CUCME router over some sort of time division multiplexing circuit, like a ISD and PRI circuit. It could send that call out to the PSTN. And we could even connect to other call agents. I could connect to a Cisco Unified Communications Manager server or a cluster, maybe at another site. And the way I could do that could be over a SIP trunk or I could have an H.323 configuration in my Communications Manager Express, which says, go to this IP address if you want to call phone numbers in this range. Something else we could do within a CUCME router is integrate a messaging solution called Cisco Unity Express. There's a module that we could put inside of the router. And we have the option of configuring Communications Manager via a GUI interface, there's a GUI interface called a Cisco Configuration Professional we could use. We could just point to it with a web browser. That can give us another graphical interface. Or what I typically do is manage the Communications Manager Express from the command line interface. Those are our two call agents. Now let's take a look at our next category of devices. Our next category of devices falls under the messaging category. And when we say messaging, I don't want you to just think voicemail because it does so much more than just voicemail. We can do some call routing. We can do some auto attendant functions using these messaging servers. And we've got one that's server-based, and we've got one that's router-based. The first one is Cisco Unity Connection, or CUC for short. It's server-based. Let's check out some of its characteristics. First of all, from a design perspective, we could have a single Cisco Unity Connection server, and that's going to support a maximum of 20,000 mailboxes for our users. 
And one reason I really want to make this point is this works a bit differently than it did with a communications manager. Remember I said with communications manager, we could simply add servers to get more capacity. And the number of users supported on a single communications manager server depends on the server platform. But toward the higher end, we can have servers that support 7,500 users per server. Well, we could add another server and suddenly we support another 7,500 users. Well, it doesn't work that way with Cisco Unity Connection. We could have a cluster of two Cisco Unity Connection servers. However, the maximum number of mailboxes is still 20,000. It does not increase our mailbox capacity which begs the question, why would you buy another Cisco Unity Connection server if it doesn't increase your capacity? Well, it sort of does increase our capacity. It doesn't give us more mailboxes, but it gives us more virtual voicemail ports. Instead of having 250 virtual connections that we can be making into this server at any one time, we can have 500. And also it gives us some redundancy. If one server goes down, the other server can take over. And we can integrate a Cisco Unity Connection server with another messaging system. We could have a couple of Cisco Unity Connection servers and we could use something that Cisco calls an intersite link to logically link those Cisco Unity Connection servers together. And there's another way that we could link these CUC servers together or we could use this next approach to link a CUC server with some other messaging server. And that solution is called VPIM. That stands for Voice Profile for Internet Mail. We're actually using email. We're using SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, to send messages, voicemail messages, between these different servers. Now let's take a look at some of the different types of call routing that's supported with Cisco Unity Connection. This is kind of interesting. If I've got my messaging server here and I've got a user that has a phone number of 2002 and then I've got a phone out on the PSTN somewhere outside of the company, here's sort of a paradox. If this user out on the PSTN calls in to our CUC server, it's going to be answered with some sort of generic greeting. Welcome to company XYZ. That's called direct routing. But if this user out on the PSTN calls extension 2002 within the company and that user does not answer or they're busy, then that call might be diverted to voicemail. And that's called forwarded routing. And the paradox is, instead of getting the system greeting saying, welcome to company XYZ, if I'm forwarded by this phone, I'm going to get the outgoing message from this user at 2002 saying, Hey, this is Kevin. I'm not able to take your call right now. Please leave a detailed message. And I'll get back with you as soon as possible. The question is, how does CUC know to play that user's outgoing message instead of the generic system greeting? Well, a couple of terms for you. The first term is DNIS, D-N-I-S, Directory Number Identification Service, or some literature might call it Dial Number Information Service. But DNIS, or D-N-I-S, that represents the dialed number. And if I dial the voicemail server directly, the DNS is going to be that voicemail server. Well, let's see what happens if I call into 2002 and it gets diverted to the Unity Connection server. Well, the DNS is still the directory number of the Cisco Unity Connection server. So how does it know that the call was forwarded rather than directly routed? Well, there's another piece of information. There's our DNS, redirected DNS which says this call was redirected from extension 2002. 2002 is the RDNS information. And if Cisco Unity Connection sees this RDNS information coming in, it says, ding, 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 I know that this is coming from a phone. And I happen to have a mailbox for that phone number. I'm going to direct this call to the outgoing message for that user's mailbox. That's a quick look at Cisco Unity Connection, our server-based messaging solution. We do, however, have a router-based messaging solution. We mentioned it earlier. It's CUE, Cisco Unity Express. This is where we can have a module installed inside of a Cisco router, and that module can contain a hard drive to store the voicemail messages that are left, or maybe it's got flash storage to store those messages, but it's got some sort of storage built in, and it's got its own operating system. It's running inside of the router, but it's got its own operating system. And that can be a great messaging solution for a small to medium sized business. We can even do some scripting with a Cisco Unity Express module to have a fairly robust auto attendant feature where somebody can call in, they're welcomed by the auto attendant, and they're given a menu of options. Press one to go to sales, press two to go to customer support, and so on. And let me give you a glimpse of what the GUI interface looks like that we can use to manage Cisco Unity Express. 
this is the graphical user interface or the GUI interface for Cisco Unity Express. And just about anything you would need to do on a day to day basis can be done through this menuing interface. Now, you can go in, if you're brave, you can use the command line interface and you can go into that operating system on the Cisco Unity Express module and you can set things up there. But if you've got the option of using this graphical interface, I would recommend doing that. One reason is that operating system on the Unity Express module inside of the router. It's not Cisco IOS. It's its own operating system. So at this point, we've talked about a couple of call agents and a couple of messaging solutions. But we've got a couple of other systems we want to talk about as well. One is the Cisco IAM and Presence server, where IAM stands for Instant Messaging. This server can communicate with our Cisco Unified Communications Manager server, and it can indicate to users if somebody is available to take a call at the moment. That's their presence information. And we oftentimes use a software-based client when using this Cisco I am in present server. It's called the Cisco Jabber client. And this Jabber client acts as an instant messaging application. We can uh, look at our contacts and see if they're available or not. We can see their presence information with a little color indicator next to their name. We can set up audio calls. We can set up a video calls. We can control an IP phone on our desktop. We can use that piece of software, the Cisco Jabber client as its own phone. And when we're logging into the Jabber client, we're actually logging into this server. Now, that phone can register with a communications manager server as a SIP speaking IP phone. But when we log in, when we launch Jabber, we're logging into the Cisco IAM and Presence server. Let's take a look at how the Jabber client and the Cisco IAM and Presence server work together in a network. One thing we want out of a presence server is we want to be able to present presence information to our clients, to our phones, to our software clients like a Cisco Jabber client. And this Cisco IAM and Presence server can learn a presence information for users over a SIP trunk connecting over to our Cisco Unified Communications Manager server. And a SIP trunk has the unique ability to carry presence information. So if I go off hook on the uh, Cisco 9971 IP phone on screen, that information that, hey, I'm on the phone, don't call me right now, that presence information is communicated over the SIP trunk from the Communications Manager server up to the Cisco IAM and Presence server, and that can be reflected on other phones or on this Cisco Jabber client. But that's not all the Cisco IAM and Present server can do for us. It can also allow a Cisco Jabber client to set up voice calls or video calls. And that's with this Cisco Jabber client working in soft phone mode. It's acting as a SIP based phone. And it can use the SIP protocol to communicate with a communications manager server, just like a regular phone, to say, hey, I want to set up a call with this Cisco 9971 IP phone. And then we can have RTP spoken between the Cisco Jabber client and the 9971. Oh, by the way, important point. Earlier, I was mentioning that Cisco IP phones could use SIP or skinny to communicate with a call agent. Well, there are some exceptions to that. There are some newer Cisco IP phones, like the 9971 and like the Cisco Jabber client, that only speak SIP. They do not speak skinny. Something to keep in mind. What else can we do with the Cisco Jabber client? Well, I mentioned soft phone mode where it was acting as its own phone. There's another mode called desk phone mode. This is where we could remotely control a phone like the Cisco 9971 that might be sitting on our desktop. We can use a protocol called CTI QBE. That stands for Computer Telephony Integration Quick Buffer Encoding to send basically remote control messages to the communications manager server saying, hey, there's a call coming in on my desk phone. I want to answer that call or I want to place a call and I want that call to be originated from my Cisco 9971 sitting on my desk. So what we're basically doing here is remotely controlling a physical phone. What else can we do with this Cisco IAM and Present Server and the Cisco Jabber client? Well, we could also do instant messaging. That's one of the primary functions of the Cisco Jabber client. Remember, we're logging in to the Cisco IAM and Present Server from the Cisco Jabber client. And the protocol that's used to do instant messaging is XMPP, which stands for Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. And something else we could do from that Cisco Jabber client, by the way, is get voicemail access. We could communicate with a Cisco Unity Connection server using IMAP that we typically use to retrieve email from an email server. We could use IMAP to get a visual listing of voicemail messages that we have sitting on that Unity Connection server. And through the Cisco Jabber client interface, we could play those messages out. We could also integrate with LDAP that we mentioned a bit earlier. 
we could do a directory lookup. We're sitting at that Cisco Jabber client and we're trying to find somebody that's in the company. We know their name, but we don't know the directory number. We could query the LDAP server to say, hey, is there somebody with this name? Could you let me connect to them? So we've got some LDAP integration possible as well. And that's a look at our Cisco IAM and Presence server. And the final core system that we have is not really a single device. It's a collection of devices. It's an umbrella of technologies that we refer to as Cisco Telepresence. Cisco Telepresence allows us to have very immersive video communications experiences. And there are a variety of telepresence endpoints. I'm showing you one here on screen, the MX200 second generation uh, telepresence endpoint. But there are smaller endpoints that could sit on our desktop. There are larger endpoints like three large screens that you could put in a room. And when you're having a video conversation using all those screens, it's high definition video, it's high quality audio. It's very much of an immersive experience, like you're sitting across the table from someone. I remember the first time I used a Cisco Telepresence system, it was a very unnatural feeling. I knew that the person I was talking to was, I think maybe they were in Dallas and I was somewhere in California. And I knew that they were not just on the other side of this flat panel, but it really seemed like they were right there. It really is a very immersive experience. But there are other things besides just the telepresence endpoints. Let's take a quick look at the role of some of the different telepresence components. One telepresence component is something we've already talked about. It's the Cisco Unified Communications Manager. How is that a Cisco telepresence component? Well, most of our Cisco telepresence endpoints can register with a Cisco Unified Communications Manager server, similar to how an IP phone can register with a CUCM server. And we mentioned there are a variety of Cisco telepresence endpoints. Here's one of the larger room systems with three large screens. And you might put this in a room that's dedicated to being your telepresence room. Or you could have a more mobile telepresence solution like the MX200 G2, which you could just move into a room to temporarily have a video conference in this room. Or we also mentioned that there are some telepresence endpoints that sit right on your desktop. And we can have video calls going directly between a couple of our telepresence endpoints, or we could introduce an MCU, a multi-point control unit, to have a video conference where we have three or more participants. And Cisco Telepresence can do some pretty cool things when we have multiple participants. Even though maybe there are five different participants in the call, it can detect who's speaking the loudest right now, who has the floor in other words, and their image can be larger on the screen than everybody else's image. Oh, and I mentioned that most of our Cisco Telepresence endpoints can register with the Cisco Unified Communications Manager server. Well, that's great if we've already decided that corporate-wide, we're using Cisco Unified Communications technologies, and we're using the Cisco Unified Communications Manager as our call agent. But what if we didn't? What if we're using some other vendor? What if we're not using the CUCM servers in our network? Who can these Telepresence endpoints register with? Well, if we're in a case like that, we could use the Cisco Telepresence server. And you can probably see that the administrative burden starts to grow as our telepresence network grows. I've got to configure this endpoint and that endpoint. I've got to go perhaps to different MCUs and uh, configure different telepresence conferences that are going to be happening. Or we could use another telepresence component. It's called the Cisco Telepresence Management Suite, or TMS. What that lets us do is manage most of our Cisco telepresence endpoints right there from a centralized point. We could also use this to set up teleconferences. Users can use this to set up teleconferences fairly easy without having to have an in-depth knowledge of how Cisco Telepresence really works. Well, now that we've talked about these different core systems, are you ready to test yourself? What I'd like you to do at this point is to download a quick quiz. I've got a PDF download for you, and you can test yourself to see if you can match up these six different core components with their function. But I know as you're considering getting into collaboration studies, you might have some concerns. You might be thinking, do I have the time for this? That's one of the big concerns that I hear. Well, my perspective on that is if you want to do something, you schedule it. If I want to get something done, rather than just thinking that, yeah, I really need to clean out the garage some Saturday. If I want to get it done, I need to put it on the calendar. And you could break this down and you could schedule your time. You could say that you're going to get up an hour early. You're going to use part of your lunch, but you're going to somehow carve out, I don't know, maybe three, four, five hours during the week to do study, to read Cisco Press books, to watch training videos. Maybe you carve out a couple of hours on the weekend, but you certainly can schedule time. It doesn't have to be done as aggressively as I proposed, but you can schedule time to study for this. 
Another concern that many people have is that it's going to be really complicated. Am I going to be able to understand this? One of my favorite quotes from Einstein is that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. In fact, I'm about to launch a couple of video trainings, one for CCNA collaboration, one for CCMP collaboration, that I would love for you to use in your studies. One of the things that I tell my students is that in order to really get the most out of your studies, it's not just enough to read through the material or watch the material and think, all right, can I get through this? Can I get through this test? No, I want you to get curious. I want you to start asking questions. I want you to fall in love with the technologies. You can get certified at a big check, just like Kevin show you how to fall in love with the tech. And another concern that I hear a lot is, am I too young? Am I too old? Does age have anything to do with this? Is this the right time in my life to go after a certification? Well, I'm going to say that age does not matter. One of the people that follows me online was recently telling me that they're working with their son. I think their son was about 12 or 13 years old. He wants his son to be the youngest CCA, which I think he said was currently about 18 years old. So yeah, even if you're a teenager, this can be for you. I started learning about Cisco Technologies when I was in my 20s. I started getting my Cisco certifications when I was in my 30s. I earned my first CCA in routing and switching when I was in my 30s. I earned my second CCA certification invoice, which I then migrated to collaboration when I was in my 40s. I got a message from someone recently asking if I thought they were too old to go after their CCA. I think they were about 44. And I was telling them, uh, no, that's about the age I was when I got my second CCIE. So I really think you can learn at any age, whether you're a teenager or maybe you have a teenager or even younger than that, you can start explaining uh, some fundamentals. You can start playing around and setting up basic networks. So I think if you fall in love with this technology, you can really learn it at any age. Now I'd like to invite you to share the wealth by sharing or liking this page on social media and also be watching your email over the next couple of days because I'm going to be sending you another free training video. I'll see you then.